what is your life's work? Okay. If you have the answer to that, the next question is, are you doing your life's work? And if you're not doing your life's work right now, the question, the last question I have for you is when are you going to start? Because what I'd like to talk to you about tonight, or to, today, sorry, is um, how I discovered my life's work and um, what it was like the journey to get there in the hope that I can help you along that same journey. Now, I'm 37 years old, and just a few months ago, I, I feel like I finally started doing what I've always wanted to do in life. I didn't always know it. So this is Project Kajimej. Project Kajimej is uh, going to be the future of digital publishing. And I've, I've launched it here in Poland for a story that's probably a little bit uh, too long to tell in this talk. But Project Kajimej really is, is a podcast right now. It is a short documentary film. And in the future, it's going to be much more reinventing how we learn and uh, how we think in the digital age. And I've chosen Poland for a very, very good reason. But this talk is not about Project Kazimierz. This talk is about how I came to the point where I was able to do this in the hopes that you'll be able to do the same thing yourself. So I want to talk about three things today. First of all is how to figure out what you want to do if you don't already know that. The second thing is how to get started on it. And then the last thing I'm, I'm going to talk to you about is how to use everything you've done up until this point in your life to get to that point or to, to get going on your journey. And then finally, I just want to share with you why I'm so passionate about this subject and why it's so important. So the first thing I'd like to go over with you is I did not know or I thought I didn't know for a long time what I really wanted to do. I, well, I kind of thought I was doing it. But I really wasn't. I'm a, uh, I like to say I'm a recovering army officer because there's a whole bunch of uh, things that come with being in the army for a long time. But along the way, there were certain clues I should have known that would have told me why or what I was supposed to be doing. And the clue for you is, what do you do for free? It's really simple. If your boss came in tomorrow and said, hey, and I'm, I'm going to try this in my company, hey, guys, we're not getting paid anymore, um, how many of you would just keep working? I think I'd lose most of them, but what would you do? And more importantly, what would you pay to do? Because if you're going to pursue your life's work, usually it's probably going to be in an entrepreneurial way. You're going to have to pay to do it for a long time, and statistically, you'll never make any money off of it. So you better figure out what you would pay to do. I love when people say, I'm going to start a business because I want to make a billion dollars. Do you love it? And if you don't, and if you wouldn't pay to do it, then it's really not worth it. So when I was going through this journey myself, I was seeing a bunch of little signposts along the road. As an army officer, what I used to do in really stressful times was I would start dabbling in digital media. It started in 2005 when I was in Iraq working 18-hour days, and at night, to blow off steam, I was building a website. Now, I wasn't coding it. My, my CTO would laugh if I coded it, but I, I was telling someone to code. I was telling someone to design for me posters. I was directing people to produce videos for me. I was, I was basically running a digital publishing company just in my free time, but I didn't really get, I didn't really figure it out. So I came back from Iraq, and then on my preparation to go to our next tour from Iraq, I created a, a troop website for the soldiers. We had 140 soldiers in our unit. I wanted to keep the families informed of what was going on. So uh, this was before the, the age of Facebook, which made it infinitely easier. We created a website, which was a novel idea back in those days for an army unit. When I got back from Iraq, I went to graduate school. Finally, a chance to rest after three and a half years of, of very uh, intense time, two tours in Iraq. And what did I do with all my free time? I started a company, uh, a tourism company in New York City. And I, I realized uh, pretty soon after I started the company, I wasn't passionate about tourism because whenever the times got tough in the business, it was really tough actually many times, I would go rebuild the website because that's what I was interested in, that's what I thought would save the business. So when I finally wound down that business while I was still in the army, well, what do I want to do next? Because I knew at this point I really didn't want to stay in the Army, but I didn't have an idea what I wanted to do. I said, okay, well, maybe I'll just start working on websites for other people. And that's the way I got evolved towards the, 
the point where I, I realize this is what I need to be doing. What do you do right now? What do you volunteer to do? What do you pay to do? What are your hobbies that you pay to do? And my grandiose vision of, of reinventing publishing doesn't have to be what your passion is. Everyone has different levels, uh, different, different levels of what they want to achieve. Uh, and and my, my cousin, who's an amazing person, he's a golf course manager. And his passion his whole life was golf. And now he's managing a golf course. And he's as happy as he's ever been because he's doing something that he's passionate about. So think about that. The next step in getting started is, and I think this is really critical before you get started, write down your life story. When I was 22, I actually was forced to do this. And if I look back on it and I read that again, that was actually what I, pretty close to what I finally decided I wanted to do. It just took me 15 years really to get started. And I was, the, the occasion was I was applying for the Rhodes Scholarship and I didn't make the Rhodes Scholarship, but I remember my mentor telling me the most valuable thing about this process is that piece of paper, 500 words. It took me six months to write it because we only had 500 words. And that was how they judged mainly how you, what you're going to do if you, or if you got the scholarship. And I wrote it down and I look back on it. That was really the blueprint for what I'm doing, which is eventually going into uh, reinventing how we train and, and, and teach leaders in the world. So when I was teaching at West Point, I made uh, some cadets that were working with me in the mentorship program do the exact same thing. Now, they'd gotten in trouble. They'd gotten in a lot of trouble, actually, and West Point was considering kicking them out. And they said, hey, go find yourself a mentor. And they came to me and said, hey, we need a mentor. I said, well, don't come to me if you want it to be easy. And they still decided to do it. So I said, all right. And what I used to do is I made them write all the time about their life, just reflecting on it. And at the end, to graduate from the mentorship program, so I could tell the administration I thought they'd learn their lesson, I said, I want you to write your obituary. It's pretty uh, morbid, isn't it? But then I said, I want you to write two versions of it. I want you to write the best case scenario, what, what you would love to do with your life, what it, would go, what it would be like if you pursued your dreams. And I said, and then write what it would be like if you don't change right now. Okay? So if you want to really get down this path, you know what you want to do, but you don't know how to get started, just write something down. Okay? Because what it's going to do is it's going to make you get really clear on what will happen if you do it. And then also write down the other version, what's going to happen if I stay in this path that I'm currently on, if I don't take that step that I know I need to take. So that's great. Write your story down. Everything's going to go great. But here's what's going to stop you. When you start down that path or when you try to make that first step, here's what stopped me. I was 13 years as an Army officer. I'd spent four years before that studying at the United States Military Academy. I had 17 years, 35 years old, 17 years, half of my life invested in this Army thing. Everyone was really proud of me. Everyone would say, thank you for your service to your country. It was great, really hard to leave. Six figure a year job in the United States. That's about half a million zlotes a year. Seven years away from a pension, a government, US government pension. That's the last thing the government's gonna cut before it goes under. If you stop paying US Army officers, you're gonna have trouble, retired US Army officers. So, that was something, everyone told me I was crazy to walk away from it. Then, I looked back at all the other things that I'd done. When I was little, I spent eight years of my life, two hours a day, practicing the trumpet. I quit my senior year of high school because my best friend beat me in the Louisiana trumpet competition. I couldn't have that. Decided to go into the Army. I had studied six years of my life, which is a really, really useful uh, major to have, history. European history, great major to have, right? Very practical, like, like developing, like coding. Very practical, great job skills. What are you going to do with that? Teach, okay? So I have three things that I thought I wanted to do when I grew up that I had to figure out and reconcile. How do I walk away from all this? I've been studying. I have a master's degree in history. I've got all this time invested in the Army. I have all these great things that I've supposedly done. I used to play trumpet, but that's a long time ago. But what you need to do and what I decided to do was how do you integrate that and make your journey into your new field unique? How do you bring your unique abilities to that? 
So how do I integrate music into publishing? I love music. I love composition. I love great music. So now I have that taste. I know how to recruit and hire people who do that. History, well, there's not much practical from it, but I know how to read quite a bit, and I know how to think about it and come to some kind of conclusion and tell a story. That's actually pretty good for the publishing industry. Even though I can't program, I can't use Photoshop, I can't do any of that other stuff, these are great skills that give me a unique perspective on this very digital project that I'm going on to. And then finally, as an Army officer, um, well, I just know how to shoot tanks and mortars and all that other kind of stuff. And actually, really, I wasn't very good at that. I just tell people how to do it. But that was my skill, not getting good at any one thing, but figuring out just enough about that and then being able to pull back and direct other people to do that. So those skills actually, which you think are a waste if you leave them, can become your greatest asset as you move on to the next thing. Okay, so that's great. You know what you need to do. You've reconciled you're, you're not walking away from things that you've done before, you're actually gonna bring them with you, but then it gets really, really hard. Story versus life. How many, how many of you have had this idea in your head of what life's gonna be like? How long does that last? I will tell you this, when I wrote the story down when I was 22 and I, I decided to reimagine it a few years ago, we had this old saying in the army, we'd, do, we'd spend a lot of time writing down these plans, no plan survives first contact with the enemy. Okay, you'd go out the gate, everything would change, and the plan was useless. But the plan might be useless when you start, but the planning was really, really powerful because it, it forced you to think about where you were going overall, and you have to understand, you have to constantly rewrite this story. On my way out of the army, a lot of things happened that went wrong, that made the story almost completely useless once I started, okay? On the way out of the Army, I was a great Army officer until I decided I was gonna get out, and then I wasn't a great Army officer. I missed a few things and got in trouble with my boss, and even though I'd had this career that on paper looked really good, on the way out, the last thing was a black mark from my boss saying, hey, you didn't do a good job. And it was very embarrassing, because Army officers don't like to be told they haven't done a great job, and it felt like I'd been fired even though I'd decided to quit before I got fired. The second thing, I was supposed to get married and that didn't work out. I broke off the engagement a month before my wedding. And then finally, my first business, which I'd started, the tour company, didn't work out. So I'd failed financially, failed in a relationship, and failed in my job. That's, those are three things, and I was reading this article, and they said, when you lose a relationship or lose a job, that's like a death in the family. You have a year's worth of mourning. Well, I had that. I had a year's worth of mourning for all those different areas of my life. And then my little brother passed away two months right after that. So the only thing I think that got me through that year where I had four different things in my life that had completely fallen apart was knowing exactly what I was doing and what I wanted to do. Because, you know, that was, that was hard. And... A lot, of, a lot of people were jealous. I'd left the army. I started traveling around the world. But really, I was just hiding from everything. The only thing I was doing while I was traveling, everyone thought I was having a great time. I was just working all the time. But it was in, you know, Australia one day, and then next, next uh, week it was in Singapore or wherever I went. But I wasn't having a great time. I was working really, really hard. I was doing it for free. wasn't getting any money. But it was, it was something I was really passionate about. And that's really important. And it's going to get you through the tough times when everything else in your life falls apart if you're really going after what you should be doing. And that's why this is so important. That's a picture up there of my mentor in the Army, uh, Colonel H.R. McMaster at the time, and Sergeant Major Burns, his, uh, his right-hand man. And I spent 18 hours a day with him throughout a, an entire year's worth of combat in Iraq, the Battle of Talfar. And we lost a lot of people there. We lost a lot of soldiers. And the hardest part about that job, aside from the, the hard work, really was writing letters home for the colonel, drafting them so that he could edit them of the people who'd been killed to their families. And he called me right after my brother passed away. And he was one of the only people who called me, actually. I mean, most friends would text you or email you and say, I'm sorry, but didn't really want to talk. But he called me, a busy three-star general, 
for about half an hour. And, and what I remember was he said, just remember what we always used to write in those letters, which is, let us live more fully so that we can honor your memory. And when I think back about my brother and what I'm doing now, he was a musician, he was a philosopher, he was, he was everything, he was a brilliant guy. And to be able to run a publishing company to make ideas get out there in the digital world in a better way and give composers some work, because he, he always complained about that, um, is really my passion going forward. And I, I could be prouder to be doing it, to have named my publishing company after my brother. And I would just like to show you a short preview of what we've created uh, starting this journey towards transforming digital publishing. If you could play the video. What's going on here is beyond normal. It's completely extraordinary in a very positive way. Luck is just what happens when, when preparation meets opportunity. And yeah, you got lucky to an extent when your video went viral, but you've been preparing for that day for a long time, I think, with your hard work and the things that you did to get ready for that. And, and that's a story that is worth spreading. Community. For entrepreneurship really to start going in, in the way that Silicon Valley has, you need a combination of the talent, um, you need the right um, amount of money, and so you need a sort of well-developed uh, venture capital and private equity um, system. Um, you also need all the legal infrastructure. And once you put those things together, then you can really see a, a great mushrooming of, of, of entrepreneurial activity. Poland is rejoining its place in Europe as Interestingly, as you point out, as old Europe seems to be turning, turning away. Entrepreneurship. Business brings the world together. It may be quite brutal, it may be quite you know, simple, it may not be very intellectual or, or refined, but there's something about the entrepreneurship. There are only two kinds of people. That the ones that are discouraged by failure and the ones that are encouraged by failure. And that what makes the difference. Technology. I, I see in the younger generation a completely different relationship with the world as a result of technology. It's Innovation in Europe by Project Kazimierz. Now another episode with your hosts Richard Lucas and Samuel Cook. Thank you very much.